Good morning, everybody. Is anybody here? Let's, uh, let's build something up. How many of you here are screenagers? <laughs> Not one screenager? That's ridiculous. How many of you are screenagers? I'll ask question again. Okay, how many of you look at your mobile phone and a TV set at the same time? How many of you look at a TV set and your PC or your laptop and your mobile phone at the same time? So you are screenagers. You're looking at multi-screens all the time. Okay, let me ask the question again. How many of you are screenagers? Ah, oh, that's much better, much, much better. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a fantastic session now for you because we've got two of the most important people in the whole world of dance music and electronic dance music. We have one of the very few underground female DJs well known all over the world, Fidelity Castro. Please give her a big hand from Berlin. Fidelity, yeah. Delighted to be here. People say there are not many women involved in tech. Fidelity is one who knows tech. She knows EDM, she knows dance music, and she is great. And then all the way from San Francisco, California, Seth Goldstein. Seth, give him a big hand, make him feel welcome. He just arrived a couple of hours ago. So great to be here at Pioneers, the great, great annual event here in Vienna. And just before we begin, what we're going to be discussing in this very important session is this. When people talk about incubation cities and incubation centers like Silicon Valley, like Tel Aviv, like Cape Town, like uh, Austin, Texas, like Berlin, to have an incubation city like Vienna, you have to have large spaces, low rental, a lot of software developers, and most important of all, you've got to have a strong DJ and dance music scene because uh, hackers and people that are involved in technology also love being DJs. So today we've got, uh, we're going to talk about some interesting stuff and just to give you some in interesting insights about electronic dance music and why this is such an important piece of technology and what we do with social media is this. The dance music business worldwide is a $4.5 billion industry. The highest paid DJ this year the highest paid DJ in the world is a gentleman who has a tattoo on his left arm and the tattoo says, enter the boldness. Calvin Harris, $46 million this year. Calvin Harris, the DJ, that's what he makes. Unbelievable. More even than Mark Zuckerberg, maybe. The second biggest DJ, uh, which is Tiesto, $42 million. So just to give you an idea of how important this is, Dead Mouse. How many of you have heard of Dead Mouse? Dead Mouse, $600,000 just for two hours in Las Vegas. But that's not why we're here. Why we're here is because we want to introduce you to Fidelity and to Seth, who are both amazing innovators and creators in their own way. So guys, here we are in Vienna. Fidelity, uh, you are a DJ mainly in the underground in Berlin, playing mainly at Sisyphus. Yes. I don't know how many people in the audience here would be aware of Sisyphus, but you've been a DJ since 2007. Yes. And you really uh, specialize in techno and house. Yes, my heart beats for techno, so I play very dark techno, actually, which by definition is only really at home in the underground. Um, what we do does not aim at all at making big millions and hundred thousands. Uh, I get fairly small fees and uh, the reason I do it is to connect and to have, um, it sounds very cheesy, but to have a feeling of unity with the people who are in the room. And um, so it's, it's interesting to hear that people see the scene as from a marketing perspective or from a financial perspective because the ravers themselves and the DJs that I'm friends with, to them it's a family, to them it's an experience, it's their life. We've all decided that this is how we're going to live. And I, I guess when the old rock legends were talking about this is rock and roll, this is what to us is electronic music. It's, it's, it's a lifestyle, it's not a business to us. Now you also have your own weekly radio show. Your show is broadcast uh, 
in Brazil on Dance Paradise. It's broadcast in France on Underground FG, in Germany on BLN.FM, yes. uh, in Ibiza on Pioneer Radio, and uh, you also play in a number of underground clubs in Berlin, uh, Rummelsbucht, yes. uh, Katerholzig, uh, Ritterbutzka, yes. Renata. Tell us a little bit about the underground club scene in Berlin, which is the leading underground scene in the world. What is, probably, what is probably interesting for people to see that the way things work in Berlin is very different from how things work in Ibiza or in London. I've seen many people come from London and try and crack Berlin and try and repeat what they, has worked in, in London or in Ibiza, and it does not work in Berlin at all. Uh, the people in Berlin are very sussed about what's what, who's who. They're very educated about the music. And the electronic music, especially for the older generation, is, is um, it's, it's a definition of self almost. A lot of uh, when the wall came down, a lot of uh, separation issues were still there. And the only common denominator was techno at the time, which was new for everyone. It was new for the kids in the East, it was new for the kids in the West, and it was the one language they could speak together without uh, discrimination or without fear of the other unknown. So, um, and um, what's different about Berlin in the market sense is that you can't go big. You can't come from the top and say, oh, we're going to spend X amount of billions on a marketing budget and we're going to launch this product or we're going to launch this event series. This is doomed to fail, I guarantee. What you have to do in Berlin is you have to do general, uh, gen sincere support. And that has to be from the trenches up. So if you want to have any chance of cracking Berlin, you have to know the underground. You have to talk like face to face to the people, not through media, not through print media, not through social media. You have to be there. You have to be in the clubs. You have to meet the people. You have to talk to them. And you have to convince them as a person. And you play every weekend in Sisyphus? Uh, no, I play about once a month, sometimes a bit more. Yeah. And you start Friday night, finish Monday morning? The parties start Friday night and they finish Monday. They start Friday around midnight and they finish at Monday around 10. But the DJ sets are between four and six hours, sometimes longer, but it's the exception. You're expected to play at least four hours. Six hours is still normal. And then everything above is kind of how you feel and how the crowd works with you. And you watch all the time to hear what's new, what's coming next in terms of DJ culture, DJ music, new mixes. You watch that. That's your fetish. That's my fetish, and that, that actually is my bread and butter. So every day I check new music. Every day I download promos. I check what's in the online stores. I play digital, so I play from SD cards. I play with Pioneer decks. And um, so I try to have very new music every week for the radio show, of course, and then every month for my set. And I'm always trying also to expand my own horizon and the horizon of the crowd. So I try to give them something they're not expecting. I'm trying to find something that is just a bit different from what we heard last week or last month. And so it's always a journey. It's always an adventure. Okay, Seth, you've come all the way from San Francisco. Uh, just a brief uh, background about yourself. Uh, you started off at age seven with your first entrepreneurial uh, activity, selling kites. Yes. That's how you started. You then uh, were an angel investor. You developed a company in 1995, site specific. You sold. Uh, over 10 years, you've been creating companies, developing companies. Uh, in uh, 2007, you started doing some stuff in San Francisco at Pier 38. Something else was invented in Pier 38. What was that? Uh, Instagram started there. It was just, a great uh, just incubator. Just uh, pick up your volume again there. Hello. Yeah, it was a great in incubator on the pier um, in San Francisco. Instagram and a number of other great companies blossomed there. And then uh, you went on uh, to create a company called Turntable.fm, which was basically the first website and music site, DJ site, that allowed uh, social media to interactively let people share music, right? Tell us about your, your intense involvement with DJ culture, DJ music. How did you get into that? 
uh, very accidentally. Um, I'm an accidental music entrepreneur because <clears throat> growing up as a venture capitalist and as an uh, entrepreneur, particularly 2003, from Napster through uh, iMeme, doing music company startups was verboten. You didn't do that because venture capitalists wouldn't fund you because the labels would sue you. So a whole generation, I think, of innovation was lost. Um, and then people started to come back uh, into the water. And, and a couple years ago, really accidentally, Billy and I started Turntable to give people a chance to listen to music together in the same virtual space. Now, Turntable wasn't available outside of the United States, but and it still what isn't. drove you to allow people to share in this new way? If you think of a, a social game plus... Um, uh, Pandora plus um, a virtual world, and you put it all together, and you've got these crazy little avatars listening to music with each other, and you go in like a jukebox in a bar, and you take turns playing music for each other. And the most important thing that that tapped into is um, it went from about zero to 500,000 users in a month, purely organically, because when you play music that you care about, um, you want to tell your friends you want to be seen as a tastemaker. And so when I chose um, a, a certain Rolling Stones music or Calvin Harris or something a lot more obscure, I'd want to let all my friends know through Facebook and Twitter that I was in this room playing this music, and if you come in, you can play with me. Uh, it was very powerful, and it, was, um, and it is very, very engaging, uh, probably the most engaging music service uh, out there. So Turntable attracted $7 million of funding from VCs in Silicon Valley, but you kept on wanting to develop and bring in new cool stuff. And uh, just a short while ago, about a year or so ago, you started a company called DJZ.com, DJZ.com, where you used emojis. Tell us about DJZ.com. Uh, so the idea behind DJZ, um, or DJZ, which uh, you might call it here, um, was to really think about democratizing the creative process of music. Um, but if you think about uh, all music services, whether it be Turntable or Spotify or Pandora or iTunes, um, really what you're doing is you're choosing somebody else's music to play. Um, now, with the advent of blogging and Twitter and, and what that's done to words that anybody can now um, write collaboratively and get comments um, socially, um, with Instagram, with photography, anybody can take a picture and become a photographer and share that. Uh, and even with video, um, and yet none of that has happened to music. Music, there's still a huge divide between those that can create music and even create electronic music and those that consume it. Um, and yet these experiences, whether it be um, like what you're talking about in Berlin or um, Burning Man or Electric Daisy or Beyond Wonderland or Coachella or Bonnaroo or any of these festivals are so powerful and communal and um, people's identities get um, established and, and reflected through those over the years. Um, people were paying a lot of money to go to these things or to prepare for these events, um, but they weren't buying music. And so there's a big dichotomy of, well, you have all this economic power and all this emotional connection to these musical environments in the offline world. Um, how could you translate some of that online? And so that was a challenge that we're trying to, to think through, which is can you democratize and open up uh, the whole process so that anybody can DJ, anybody can kind of throw their own festival, anybody can connect uh, in that way and, and connect the online world to the offline world. You've always been very involved in art and the development of art. You were even at the Karlsruhe uh, Art College. Uh, yes, yeah, the Center you, for Art and Media Technology in Karlsruhe in 1993. Some years ago. Yeah. Uh, but also, the interesting thing about DJZ.com, I don't know whether we're able to even pull up that site on the screen here, but the art and the, the look and feel that you did at that site really created a whole new look and feel from Silicon Valley that's really cool. Um, and uh, what it also did was it allowed you to choose emojis to represent the music, say the drums, the synth, uh, in a whole interesting new way that was really groundbreaking for the DJ and the dance music scene. Well, I think, um, does anybody here produce music, electronic music, or use Ableton, or Native, or Logic? It's a couple hands, but it's pretty arcane. 
right? It's, it's, it's hardware and desktop software, and you really have to have spent months, if not years, using it. I have an 11-year-old, and he wanted to be a DJ um, once he heard Bangarang from Skrillex on the radio last year. And um, I walked through with him the process of learning, um, and it's apocryphal. It's really hard. Um, and so, and yet, everybody's used to using their iPhones or their Android devices for Angry Birds or for some other app or game. Um, and yet, this incredibly vibrant, creative process of DJing um, hasn't, made it, hasn't made it to this platform and hasn't made it into everybody's pocket. And so, that's what we're trying to do. Um, it's going to be um, a bastardization in the beginning because we're not going to enable the art that you're able to do with the tools that you've been using for many, many years. Um, but I think over time, um, as our environments are digital, um, you know, I walk into my office or my house now and I can control my Philips lights, I can control my Sonos speakers, I can throw anything I have here onto my internet connected TV that it's, not, it's, it's probable, not just conceivable, that in a couple years, we'll walk into any environment and we'll just start mixing our environment, visually and audio. Well, talking about that, we're here to make a big announcement here today at Pioneers. Pioneers always likes to do something cool, break the ice, break uh, whole new barriers. And you're going to be announcing for the first time in Central Europe this new platform you've developed called Crossfader. Yep. where you say, if you can move, you can mix. Tell us about it. I should show it. Okay, let's show it. That's a good idea. Right, Crossfader. Talk to Fidelity while I okay, get it um, set up. So Fidelity, um, what we're going to do is, uh, Seth is going to show us this uh, new application he's built, which he created with his team. He has a special space in San Francisco, which they call the Kaz Bar, with some really cool, hip, hot people that are creating these things. He's going to show this to us, and why we're doing this, Fidelity, is you, the DJ, you work in the underground, not the overground, uh, and uh, we'd like you to take a look at this, and we want to see what you think of this as we do a road test of this great new uh, app, or uh, well, at least Seth thinks it's uh, new. Uh, I'm hoping the audience here at Pioneers would also see this as being something interesting. So, Seth, uh, tell us when you're ready to rock, to deep gas, and let's do it. No, I, gotta, I think I have to put it separate. Okay, how are we doing this, Ed? Okay. So when I move the, the iPhone, let's make sure the voice comes out, please. What are you actually doing? So all I'm doing is I'm just grabbing little pieces and bits of music. These are 30 second samples. You can buy any one of these in the iTunes store. Um, you're mixing drums and vocals and you're, you're DJing. And then starting in a few months, 
we will allow artists to sell STEM packs directly through the app. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to acknowledge that what the hallmark of EDM as a movement is engagement, that people really want to feel connected to the music. And so the idea of feeling connected and yet only having a five minute song that you lean back and you have to listen one way feels out of keeping. And it's like a Polaroid camera right now, it's pretty simple, but there's no reason it can't get more and more subtle and more sophisticated as real artists like Fidelity do interesting things with it. Um, so, Seth, when we spoke about screenagers at the start of the session, where people are now using mobile phones for so many things, you're effectively democratizing music and allowing people to use their mobile phone to become a DJ and then share that with their friends. That's, is that the goal of this particular platform and app? Yes. It's just fun. Go to crossfader.com. Um, if you go to the Apple Store now, uh oh. In can the Apple Store, just search for Crossfader please? and you'll see, and you can download it and play with it. I think it's a. Can I ask? Can we got some volume, please? Oh, just come closer to me. <laughs> what, it's really what, the app made me, what the app made me want, and this is a very interesting aspect actually of DJing. It wanted me to kick your ass. I wanted to get on the phone and have a go and have a little battle almost, you know? And, and this is what like I can a, see. Like a DJ between. battle? Yeah, yeah, so this is what you did. And, and I was sitting here and like I was thinking, I want to go, I want to go, you know? And I think it's, it's a way to have this experience of being with friends and kind of making a collective mixtape. You know, you used to make a mixtape for your friends, sharing your music, and I think sharing your music is a very intimate and very kind thing between two or more people. It's kind of showing who you are. It's, it's, it's kind of undressing the soul. It's being naked in front of your friends. This is what I like. This is, this is what touches me. This is what moves me. And in this app, people can share uh, their music, but they can do it together. You're not sitting at home doing it alone, and then you give it to your friends. You're kind of doing it on the go. This is kind of what my first reaction to the app. So, Seth. Seth, this, uh, this application, if you can move it, you can become a DJ. This means that this is available on uh, iOS, Apple phones, and will it be on Android? What are the other platforms that you're building it on? Yeah, iOS 7 is best. That is best? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, just in terms of a lot of the stuff we're doing here, uh, Devin, my co-founder, is here who programmed a lot of this. Devin, are you? Where is uh, Devin? Devin's where right are there. you? He's very Let's... tall. Um, Devin, are you there? Where is he? There He's he is. There. Stand up, Devin. Um, Show the people at the back what you look like. That very handsome guy from California. Right. Girls, look at him. Ooh. Very good, Devin. Get a round of applause there. So just so technically, this is called Parallax. This is a feature of iOS 7. You, you can see the, the, the shading and the focus coming in and out of focus as the music's coming in and out of focus. Um, so a lot of things we did graphically with Apple to be uh, featured as part of the iOS 7 launch. Um, and we'll continue to do that. And we just can't do that on Android uh, for the time being. But the idea really is to broaden this so that everyone can be a great DJ. You can do your own mashups, your mixing. You can do everything. Can you then send that on to your Facebook friends and to your social media linkages? Yes. So it sounds pretty interesting. What do you think? I think what is good about the app as well, and I've had to play around with it before, and I, I, I enjoyed it. It was fun. I think what's good to see is also how much more there is to DJing than just beat matching, because it, it does take the beat matching part away. It does that for you, so everything is beat synced. But you still have to choose what you like, and you still have to tell a story. I mean, most DJs try and tell a story with their music. They take a journey and they express their own feelings through the music of others, and more and more by um, remixing on the fly, more and more controllers and, and, and decks allow you nowadays to play live remixes of tracks. People do not play end-to-end -end mixes in like in the analog vinyl days where you just start at the intro, you mix the intro and the outro and then you play the track and then you play the next record. I think nowadays people are much more into being creative themselves, expressing themselves, and, and this app uh, is, is a great way to find out that it's not just mixing one record to the, to the next. You have to think about what, where you want to go and how you want to entertain your friends.
I think you know we're we're such a part of. Uh, I'm gonna move. Uh, remix culture, that when when we are all together at a festival, and it depends whether it's techno or house or moonbaton or wh whatever the genre might be, but I felt um, you know you're with 10 or 20,000 people, they're playing music, and then the DJ invokes some clip. Like I remember I was at Hard Day of the Dead in LA last year, and, and I think it was Major Lazer, Diplo was on stage, and out of nowhere came Paul Simon. And it was just a really beautiful moment, and it meant something, and then it, it, it faded away, but I think everybody here has a literacy from the age of, we can get any music we want from Spotify, we can get any video we want from YouTube, to be able to seamlessly uh, sing electronically and create music with your friends um, where you're invoking all of your memories and all of your interests um, is something that I think is universal and people want to do. Unfortunately, we've been beaten by the clock. We have to come to an end. But Seth and Fidelity will be out here to answer questions about what Fidelity does as an underground DJ, what Seth is doing as a creator, as a, his own VC, and developing some really, really cool stuff in uh, San Francisco. So please, we'd like you to give a big pioneers thank you and round of applause to Seth Goldstein. Thank you. To Fidelity Castro. Come on, girls, give her a big round. And from myself, Ralph Simon, thank you for listening. This is an important area. Electronic dance music is where it's at. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.